I will now give the floor to His Excellency uh, Mohammed bin Abdul Salam. Uh, he is the generally the general secretary of the uh, Muslim Council of Elders. He has many other responsibilities. Uh, I will only mention two. He is a member of the Al-Hazard Center for the Interreligious Dialogue. As you all know, Al-Hazar is one of the main centers of the Sunni, t uh, Sunni world. He is also the personal advisor to his eminency, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Professor Ahmad Al-Tayyib. It is very important to underline this. Your Eminence, you will speak with a particular authority about a problem that is very important to us this morning. In the name of God, the All Merciful. Good morning, everyone. May Allah's peace and the blessings be upon all of you. The title is very interesting. I hope that all of you are listening to the interpretation. Can you follow? Are, are, are you hearing the interpretation? Okay, great. Does it work? Now it's good. First of all, first of all, allow me to express my personal appreciation to you, Your Excellency Professor Terry Dumonter Brell, the chair of the session, for convening this. Uh, a very important consultative and intellectual meeting which has a very special and much needed uh, headline and theme. The international system between globalization and disintegration which forces will prevail. What an interesting question. Ladies and gentlemen, your old holiness, my dear brother, Bartholomew the first your excellency uh, dear rabbi my dear brother and dear friend at the outset I feel a great uh, gratitude and appreciation for inviting me to participate in this high level meeting the world policy conference an esteemed institution founded and chaired by the venerable professor Terry de Montebrel, a distinguished intellectual and expert, president of the French Institute for International Relations, IFRI, which, uh, as we all know, is uh, France's premier and uh, uh, top research center. I would like also to renew the welcome for the third annual convening of this conference here in Abu Dhabi, a capital city that holds great personal significance for me. I place uh, a place I fondly refer to as the capital of human fraternity. Among its many inspiring milestones, it witnessed four years ago the historic signing of the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together by His uh, Holiness Pope Francis, the head of the Catholic Church, and his brother, His Eminence, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar Sharif, when they visited this country for the first time in history in the presence of different religious leaders to proclaim and announce the document on human fraternity for all the world. It is unprecedented declaration in our modern time history. This was uh, on February 4th, on 2019, a day which has been announced and adopted by the United Nations General Assembly as an International Day of Human Fraternity, celebrated each year worldwide. 
I believe that my participation in this session, which represents the three Abrahamic faiths and discusses the quest for hope in a better world, imparts upon me a particular responsibility to speak about the potential of Islam in fostering this hope. Its experience is deeply intertwined with the history of the heavenly religions, all of which originated in the Middle East region, a sea upon whose shores prophecies descended and philosophies formed that remain powerfully present and influential in the, con in the conscience of and thought of humanity. This is the same region that, to our profound regret, suffers today from a bloody and devastating war which at every moment claims the lives of innocent civilians, presenting a scene that imposes a collective responsibility upon us all towards humanity, not only towards the innocent uh, casualties and the children, but towards our all humanity worldwide. It confronts us with the world we live in, a world that is indeed in a dire need of a dose of hope, a hope that can be forged through our will, the sincerity of our humanity, and our belief in justice for achieving peace for all people without discrimination. The, seeing the, the scenes of devastation and bloodshed in Gaza is a, a deep wound in the body of our humanity. We all agree that healing this wound will take time and it is not easy to address. We are at a turning point in the history of our common hum humanity. And in through the past years and the years we live and the upcoming years and the f of the future generations, we all hope to see the world respecting human rights generally and not only chanting slogans but uh, activating these motives and slogans on the ground islam has cultivated hope for the future through its universal relationships of man with god the world and his fellow human beings it fosters a relationship of trust and hope in god and confidence in his power the relationship with the world by considering it as a realm entrusted to humans who bear the responsibility of its stewardship and preservation for the benefit of future generations, a relationship with humanity through the values of justice, compassion, and solidarity. Therefore, when the Quran regards the prophethood of Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the culmination of the divine revelations to humanity, a continuation of the message carried by all prophets and describes him as a mercy to the world, it means precisely that. The meaning of uh, mercy and its inclusivity for all people, not only for Muslims, but for all people. Considering revelation or religion as a beacon of hope for mankind and a mercy for all creatures, precisely as the French author and thinker André Marlow affirmed when he said that the 21st century, either it be based on spirituality or it will not be at all. And as you have referred to your old holiness, we are in a dire need to have the presence of the spirit of faith in our uh, daily life in order to overcome the challenges. And also considering the, the message of uh, this final prophet as a message to all humanity, because universality should be considered as a characteristic that religious message is based on a spiritual faith, voluntarily eth ethical commitment and solidarity for the benefit of mankind. In contrast, globalization in its cultural aspect seems to be based on homogenization and attempts to externally standardize identities and cultural experiences according to a unified model. From this perspective arises the importance of initiatives that establish universality of religious values while preserving diversity and harnessing the spiritual power of religions to address the pressing questions of mankind and church challenges. Just as articulated in the document on human fraternity, which has been signed by the Pope and the Grand Imam in a moment of hope, we hope that we all build 
on it all. And as the Abrahamic family house in Abu Dhabi provides a common space, not just for coexistence among these three religions, but also as a sphere for dialogue and cooperation among them. The Abrahamic family house is a beacon of hope, but it is also at the same time poses a challenge how we can use, use this hope to foster peace. Peace, which is a quest and a cause we all aspire for, but we miss it. Allow me here to reaffirm that the opening of the Abrahamic family house in 2023 was indeed an extraordinary moment by all standards, a moment that allows me to say that I look toward the horizon. I can almost see many generations to come posing at this moment and reflecting on these steps. The inauguration of the Abrahamic family house and the signing of the document on human fraternity in Abu Dhabi, the capital city of coexistence and the human fraternity. It is truly an inspiring, inspiring moment, inspired by the story of this house, by faith of courage, patience, and goodwill. When we have these three houses of worship uh, in one space, em embracing each other and sending a message of hope and hoping that uh, uh, a hope that we all aspire for in, in our meetings. The reason for the existence of religions is to preserve the reservoir of hope in enchanting the common good. And, and, and this gives us a, a, a pride picture for this hope. However, it also presents a challenge, and this makes it a worthwhile to ask how the three monotheistic religions can work together to realize the, their core shared values. How these, how all religions, not only monotheistic religions, how they can adopt a unified stance and send out a unified cry for the realization of justice and peace. I am fully convinced that victory will side with every benevolent force in our world that champions the essence of our humanity upholds these values and defend them. And as you have uh, mentioned, your All Holiness, uh, Archbishop Bartholomew, the duty now is imparted on religious leaders and faith leaders, and it is a great, it is a great challenge. We have many challenges in every aspect of life: the challenge of uh, international wars, internal wars, and conflicts. And we have a catastrophic challenge that is threatening the future of our future generations, which is the climate change crisis. Your Excellency, Professor, I would like to thank you profoundly because you truly believe in the role of religions and the contribution and the voice of faith leaders. And I invite you and uh, other intellectuals and uh, highly influential experts and people to, to to dedicate their efforts to to the cause of humanity because more than 84 percent of the world's population are religious and affiliated to uh, a faith or a religion the voice of religion is very important and our world today is in a dire need for for having the voice of uh, religious leaders. And I was very happy when I, uh, when I heard the uh, President Macron uh, when in a conference in Rome in 2021, 20, when he said, our world today, I quote him, our world today, politicians need the voice of religion, unquote. And now we are facing the challenge of climate change, and the United Arab Emirates is hosting the COP28. And tomorrow, we will have evidence that highlight the importance of the voice of uh, religions as we organize a global faith leader summit that bring all faith leaders in one meeting and in one summit, representing all faith and religious denominations worldwide. And some also 
who uh, are not represent those who don't believe the unbelievers in our world they all you stand in unity and uh, solidarity to send a unified message and voice to the leaders of, of our world who will be convening at the COP28. It's also uh, another evidence that our world will, will need the voice of religious leaders that the COP28 for the first time in history will have faith pavilion during the COP28. For almost 13 days, will host and will welcome more than 300 speakers from different parts in the world. They will reflect, think, and discuss the challenges of climate change and how faith-based organizations and religious people and leaders can communicate, uh, can contribute to addressing this crisis. And this uh, faith pavilion is co-organized cooperation between the Muslim Council of Elders, the COP28 uh, Presidency, and the United Nations Pro Environment Program. And in, to conclude, I would like to thank you all and would like to thank uh, you, Professor, and uh, we have to seize this opportunity to uh, inspire people with a message of hope. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And I would like to underline I would like to underline what you said, uh, Your Excellency, and uh, what's, what his uh, eminence said before you about the responsibility of uh, leaders, and namely the leaders of religious institutions. Um, a meeting like our meeting this morning shows a certain courage to say these words that you just said uh, at a um, moment of a major crisis uh, takes a lot of courage and is very uh, significant.